Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's Wednesday, February 15th, year 2012. Now, joining us on the program is Adam Kokesh of Adam vs. the Man. He's going to discuss the Veterans March on Washington to bring attention to the fact that the veterans have financially contributed to Ron Paul's campaign and the media has ignored it. And they're going to try to force that issue into the mainstream. Great idea. That's all coming up. We have all kinds of war news and more. But as you know, this is not a scripted teleprompter show. And sometimes it's actually bad because I, I was just right before the show adding stories, digging details. When you read up on these people, it's disgusting uh, when you see all the nexus points and all the hidden agendas. And, and the more you dig, the more nasty stuff there is. You're going to see it coming up with the World Bank news and with the Bill Gates news. So stick with us. But first, let them eat yellow cake. Iran gives enemies another excuse to bomb them. And of course, in the primary sense, it's more saber rattling uh, as the war is made to look imminent, as we're told in the media from all sides that the war is going to happen as ships and troops are all uh, moved in to surround the area. Now, Kurt Nemo's got the report. Iran has provided the U.S. and Israel with another excuse to attack the country has announced it will now produce yellow cake. The head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, Fari, Faridun Abbasum, you can tell my Arabic and Persian is not too good, said on Wednesday Iran has installed a new generation of centrifuges at the Nantaz facility. Now, of course, yellow cake was used in the propaganda in the buildup to the Iraq war. It'll probably be used now for the Iran war, even though the countries are only one letter apart. Uh, supposedly, the general public's not even going to notice that they're using the same reasons again. But even if you just want to stay on the surface of this issue, you can't build up dictators, play chess with them, and then get upset when they turn out to not be your friends in the end. You don't trust dictators in the first place. We shouldn't be putting them in and trying to do all these Arab Spring things for decades and decades. Now, of course, it's a fact that Donald Rumsfeld met with Saddam Hussein back in the 80s when Iraq was at war with Iran, and we wanted to support that war and make sure they killed at least a million people. And so Rumsfeld sold him WMDs and chemical weapons and all that stuff, and later it kind of became a problem. Well, maybe it's a problem with Iran, too, because when the Shah was in power, we were helping them build nuclear reactors, and now it's somehow not acceptable. Well, you got to factor that into your strategy that your friends and allies are going to get kicked out of power or they're going to go bad on you. It's just absurd. Uh, you know, it's gallows humor because I hope this war doesn't happen. But, of course, this war uh, is spiraling into a regional at least war and quite possibly the third uh, overt world war as Syrian opposition seeks to wipe the Assad name off the map via Google. Now we know these tech companies have given a great deal of support to the whole Arab Spring and all the Western backed intervention in that Middle East region and here's just sort of more evidence of it. They're taking the Assad name off of the map just as Places like the Czech Republic did uh, on the streets, removing their signs during the Velvet Revolution so Russia would become disoriented back in the low-tech days and not be able to find their way around. Uh, well, I guess this is not really like that. It's kind of more of a propaganda thing to let Assad know that he's been surrounded and that the technology giants are backing the regime change and pushing us into war. But the reports in the Washington Post, any government activists in recent weeks have used a Google crowdsourcing program, MapMaker, to rename key streets, bridges, and boulevards after the revolutionary heroes, according to oppositional figures in the Syrian government. The idea, activists say, has been to expunge the vestiges of the Assad family's 40-year rule and to commemorate protesters who've fallen over the course of the 11-month-old uprising and to make sure that al-Qaeda is used to bring the country down and make sure that al-Qaeda is always our ally when we pretend they're our enemy to the American public. And, of course, I'm ranting, and it's not like I'm saying Assad is good. I really don't like dictatorships as a form of government. But this is about uh, Syria being a domino specifically a domino to topple another domino and on and on. That's what this is about. It doesn't have anything to do with the issues of Syria or what its people actually want. Uh, this is a fomented false revolution to prevent real revolutions from spreading across the world so that the empires uh, who work in conjunction, the kind of multipolar Bilderberg people, can keep their client states in check. And uh, there are other ways of keeping clients in check. One of them is the World Bank. Uh, it's a twin organization, of course, of the IMF. Uh, both were set up in the waning years of World War II before the victor was officially decided. 
uh, at the Bretton Woods Conference, and it went with all those financial agreements. But what the IMF really does is set conditionalities on third world countries primarily and keep them in the empire, even as uh, particularly the British Empire was running out of money, was forced to formally relinquish control over many of those regions, but wanted to, of course, keep the maximum influence in all those areas. The IMF and the World Bank were a great vehicle to make that happen because they could give loans to those countries knowing the countries could never pay them back and meanwhile impose their dream uh, police state provisions on the countries, low wages, you know, factory slave work, uh, super globalization policies, uh, infrastructure takeover, and of course privatization of all the resources for the corporate interests around the world who are hooked up with the larger system. Now, with that said, uh, World Bank President Robert Zolik, appointed in the final years of President Bush, is planning to step down in June. And there's a toss-up between if Hillary Clinton might take the post, or if Larry Summers might take the post, or if it would be some other uh, tool puppet who's going to help to uh, impose harsh things on various parts of the world. Of course, now the IMF and World Bank are being used in Europe. I'm sure it'll come to America in due time. But who's better? Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, at, as Secretary of State, head of the State Department, committed since 1974 to Henry Kissinger's uh, depopulating the third world as the greatest number one strategy through the guise of food aid, food as a weapon, or pushing vaccines on countries. She's great at that, so she would be very good at the World Bank. They also like to push vaccines and, and use that kind of thing as a conditionality for aid, uh, all the micro-lending schemes they do. On the other hand, Larry Summers is very good at screwing people over, using fraudulent economic systems to induce people into greater poverty and debt, and he really played a large role, not only in dismantling Glass-Steagall, but in all the other things he did in the Clinton administration and the years after to trigger our current economic collapse. So he really would be great at the World Bank also, but I can't decide which uh, evil puppet would be better. That is until I did some more digging on Larry Summers, and I think I've got to go with him, because he was already at the World Bank as the chief economist in 1991, uh, in, well, that was the Bush years, wasn't it? The first Bush. And he has a little scandal, which I think is kind of nice. This would be good for the third world. Now I'm being sarcastic. He, he has responded to the controversy over this memo after it leaked, saying it was sarcastic. It's really very nasty and really reveals the globalist mindset, how much they hate humanity, hate the third world, and want to use their corporate takeover model to really kill off a lot of people, too. Now, this is known as the Summers Memo. You can look it up on Wikipedia and other entities. Uh, it was disseminated in 1991. Larry Summers signed it along with uh, Lant Pritchard. Uh, Lant Pritchett is allegedly the guy who wrote it. Anyway, it reads, Dirty Industries, just between you and me, shouldn't the World Bank be mo encouraging more migration of dirty industries to the least developed countries? I could think of three reasons. The first, the measurement of cost of health impairing pollution depends on the foregone earnings from increased morbidity and mortality. You mean how they get everyone sick with cancer and then milk uh, the medical treatment money out of people in the West? Well, he says that strategy is not really good for the developing world. And so uh, Larry Summers and his buddy Lamp Pritchett get more into this whole sarcastic philosophy of uh, how you can't poison them long term in the developing parts of the world. You have to kind of pollute them quickly. Now he talks about point number two, the cost of pollution are likely to be nonlinear as the initial increments of pollution probably have a very low cost. He's always thought that the underpopulated countries in Africa are vastly under polluted. In all caps, the air quality is probably vastly inefficiently low compared with Los Angeles and Mexico City. So they should put more toxic pollution in these countries. And uh, he gets to the fact that it would be hard to trade um, more into this point of how, in number three, when they have a mortality rate under age of five at 200 per thousand, it's kind of hard to uh, milk money on things like prostate cancer out of them. Uh, it's better to pollute them more in the short term. Then he concludes this little tongue-in-cheek memo about poisoning the third world and wreaking the profits with the problem with the arguments against all these proposals for more pollution in the least developed countries, including intrinsic rights to certain goods, moral reasons, social concerns, lack of adequate markets, etc., could be turned around and more or less effectively used against every bank proposal 
for liberalization. And yeah, that form of trade liberalization is very predatory. It's not good for the actual people of these least developed countries. It's only really good for the predator class that wants to totally exploit those countries while keeping them under the larger wing of the empire. And of course, a lot of these very predatory dynamics are outlined in John Perkins' book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Uh, you can also pretty much understand it by watching documentaries like Life Plus Debt about how the IMF was used to further destroy Jamaica and really put it into just completely unsustainable debt as they preach to the world about sustainable environments, sustainable economies. Anyway, so in a skexy sort of manner, I say we do nominate Larry Summers for World Bank president because he did such a good job as uh, economic chief there and really showed his love for the third world and the people there. Now, in sort of related news, because Larry Summers is on Obama's economic council, Obama on failed promise to cut deficit in half. Recession turned out to be a lot deeper. Oh, he didn't know. He thought things were going to improve, but it turns out they're not really going to improve. Well, we're not there because this recession turned out to be a lot deeper than any of us realized. Obama said about his inability to cut the deficit in half uh, in an interview. And... Well, didn't they tell him his job is just to distract everyone while they, you know, successfully complete the total implosion and consolidation of wealth operation, the greatest transfer of wealth in all of history, the looting of the middle class, the squeezing of the middle class, the further deprecating of the poverty class, the uh, increase of the gap between the super wealthy and everyone else. Yeah, good job, Obama. Just keep telling him it's going to be all right. And uh, don't look at the man behind the curtain, whatever you do. And, of course, a lot of people have wondered how truth could have ever been aired in the first place on a mainstream, uh, mainstream, M-E-M-E, -E, uh, regurgitated propaganda media channel like Fox News. Well, now we sort of have our answer as Napolitano's show has been canceled, Judge Napolitano. So long, America, only truthful mainstream news show ends. Napolitano signs off from Free to Watch with the promise to keep defending freedom whenever I can. And of course, you heard about this in the days past, but he's uh, ended his final episode with a promise to keep fighting for freedom and a reminder that even the revolutionary battle was not won easily. There was never a majority. It was always that tireless minority that John Adams talked about. He said, the judge closed the last edition of Freedom Watch in the same way he normally does with a message regarding adherence to the vision of the Founding Fathers and the hard-fought liberties protected by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Napolitano flagged up the fact that only a third of Americans supported the revolution and another third expressed no interest in the matter. Now it's 90 percent, but we've got to make do with what we can. In a clear message to his critics, the judge noted the Founding Fathers risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, but they were not saints, and uh, originally their cause was not popular. And uh, freedom is popular in the hearts of men and women today. People are learning and rediscovering liberty. Judge Napolitano did play a part in that. We shouldn't give up. We've had so many victories already. We've got to realize that, but we've got to use the power of the Internet and the other new media techniques while they're still at our hands to make sure that message is heard by everyone, whether they ignore it, whether they, they curse it and, and laugh at it and scoff at it, or whether they take heed and start taking action like so many of our viewers have done. We are going to win this battle, and uh, Napolitano will keep doing his part, but the part on Fox News apparently is coming to an end. Another alarming item, Prepper declared mentally defective put on FBI list. Uh, now, this is uh, David Sardi. You may have seen him if you're in the TV watching culture. I no longer am. Uh, on Doomsday Prepper, the popular National Geographic show. And uh, he went into the doctor. Uh, he's a very large guy, may have had a lot of uh, heart problems. Uh, I've heard about him having breathing problems. And it says when Sardi refused to have tubes inserted, Olivier, his doctor, insinuated that he would be suicidal and insisted on Sardi going to the emergency room. Sardi refused and left the hospital, but within 15 minutes of arriving at his home, police arrived at his house and forcibly took him to the emergency room. When Sardi later attempted to purchase a Glock 21 firearm, he was flagged by the National Instant Criminal Background Check System and refused the sale. When he appealed, he received a letter from the FBI stating that he had been declared mentally defective and was not allowed to own firearms. Now, there's a few elements to this story. Are they trying to send a message 
to people in the prepper or near the prepper community out there that uh, they won't be allowed to do what they're doing to try to discourage people from joining this community. I don't know. All I know is I've seen the YouTube from David Stardy, his account of the story, and he says the doctor was trying to insinuate he was suicidal. He told him, no, I'm not suicidal. I'm a Christian. My ethics don't allow me to commit suicide. I'll never commit suicide. But he was put on this mentally defective list anyway, taking away his uh, uninfringible Second Amendment right. And he's gone on to say he really... Uh, almost lost interest in doing his prep work, saying he even has nothing to live for if he doesn't have uh, his right to bear arms. And whatever you may think of this real interesting character who's being uh, broadcast on TV, he's got a point. I mean, there's something fundamental about that right to bear arms. We can all see the tyranny closing in. It's very disturbing they're doing this because they're going to be doing it to a lot of returning veterans and a lot of other people, too. Uh, anyone who exp expresses the interest to seek help for trauma, uh, to call those hotlines. You may have seen the case this week uh, where a returning veteran did call one of these help hotlines. He said he wasn't even suicidal, wasn't even talking about that on the phone. Suddenly the police showed up at his house to disarm him. I mean, this is scary stuff, and they're going to try to bring all these war-weary troops back home and uh, really disenfranchise them from the Second Amendment right. That is another big sneak attack on the Second Amendment. Everyone should watch for that, and we should try to fight against that trend. Because, uh, as you can see, it's going to be matched up on the FBI criminal background check. Really disturbing times we're in. Now, uh, back on January 27th, I had to check the date. I did kind of an in-depth report on Bill Gates, because everyone's wondering, why does Bill Gates have 500,000 shares in Monsanto? Why has he suddenly become so obsessed with GMO crops? Uh, why do he and the Rockefeller Foundation have the new Agra partnership to push GMO in Africa and other parts of the third world? Well, the story goes even deeper than I realized. Back uh, five years ago when I was doing research with Alex on Endgame, Alex told me about how it wasn't just Bill Gates. It was his father, William Gates Sr., uh, who had been a board member of Planned Parenthood for years and years and years, for many decades. And uh, I did that research at the time. I forgot about a lot of this, though, and I went back, found the article that's linked. You can find it for yourself off of Wikipedia. Salon from 1998, January 29, 1998. Is Bill Gates a closet liberal? And the point of this article is not whether or not Bill Gates is a, quote, liberal. He's a New World Order minion for depopulation. That's what you need to know. But what's interesting in the article is that before Bill Gates left Microsoft and even set up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, which is now the largest foundation, it's as powerful as government, uh, he's just coming up with all these policies, everything from global seed vaults uh, to geoengineering funds, all kinds of just really wild stuff, making his own policy, and it's taking effect on the whole world. Well, there's a reason. It's because his father, William Gates Sr., is deeply into eugenics as well. For some reason, all these technology people are. Uh, if you could pull up the founders list, the foundations who have donated large amounts of money to population control efforts under various names across the world for many years, many of them donate hundreds of millions of dollars each year, some of them only a few million, but they include the Gates Foundation, uh, but it's also the Hewlett Foundation. It's the Packard Foundation, you know, Hewlett Packard. Both of them separately have their own foundations, all giving money to eugenics, to population control measures, trying to bring down the population rates. Of course, the Rockefeller Foundation is there. The Ted Turner Foundation, who said we should have a 95% reduction uh, of humanity. And, of course, George Soros' Open Society Institute, donating to depopulation measures. Uh, you... You probably heard about how they all met in secret at the Secret Billionaires Club in a bid to uh, overturn population. They met at the Rockefeller University. It was all covered up in the media. Well, anyway, I am rambling here, but the point is Bill Gates' father, before Bill Gates started the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, had his own foundation, the William H. Gates the Third Foundation, and he was giving money to GMO crops back in the mid and late 90s. Uh, he gave at least $12 million to the University of Washington, they're from the Seattle area, to lure in the leading biotech professor and scientist at the time, Leroy Hood. He is, or at least was at the time, the William H. Gates the Third Chair of the UW Biotechnology Department. 
and uh, they spent all this money to build a brand new facility to bring biotech into the mainstream. So why is Bill Gates now pushing GMO? Your answer is right here in plain sight. They've been part of it for a long time. I've studied the Bilderberg membership list. Bill Gates' father attended Bilderberg meetings before even Bill Gates did. Bill Gates himself has been there multiple times. Other people from Microsoft have repeatedly been to Bilderberg meetings. And I, if I'm not mistaken, even his wife, Melinda Gates, has been to the Bilderberg meetings. Of course, Rockefeller is there every year. They coordinate all these depopulation efforts, and they spend a lot of money, as I covered on the January 27th program, paying media to give them uh, positive coverage. And uh, they're just behind it all. It's interesting to note that William Gates Sr. also was involved for decades with the PATH program, that's the program for appropriate technology in health, uh, which is one of the leading euphemism agencies for eugenics. He was also involved in donating to the Alan Guttmacher Institute. Alan Guttmacher is a former Planned Parenthood executive, then spun off and had his own foundation pushing these population issues. He was involved with donating to the Department of Population Dynamics at Johns Hopkins University, millions of dollars there, and just everything to do with reproductive health and family planning. And here again is this Salon article by author Andrew Leonard back in 1998 talking about how billionaires have always had a fond spot in their hearts for population control. Names Ted Turner, names Warren Buffett, and... Um, George Soros, they're all part of the same club, the Good Club, where they meet with Oprah Winfrey to try to bring down the world population. But whatever you call it, the article goes on to say, population control or, quote, family planning, all buzz terms they coin at various UN agenda meetings and everything else, isn't just a billionaire fad for the Gates family. They are dedicated to it. Bill Gates Sr. was on the national board of Planned Parenthood and was instrumental in getting the Gates Foundation grant for Johns Hopkins. And so there you have it. They've been deeply involved in population control measures for decades. And it's just a fact. And why are all these tech companies involved in eugenics? I don't know. IBM was involved in Hitler's eugenics program where they put the tattoos on the concentration camp victims and, and ran the matrix system using the punch card holler system at the time. So for whatever reason, Hewlett Foundation, Packard Foundation, Gates Foundation, so many of them are involved. And uh, there's another thing, too, because you heard about how the high fructose corn syrup was rebranded as corn sugar because there's been so much opposition in the public. We've had so many victories spreading information about all the poisons they're putting into modern food products. Uh, we've covered the aspartame at length. We covered the water fluoridation. We're having a lot of victories there, too. And the uh, corn-associated people have had to back off from that branded name, high fructose corn syrup, and had to rebrand it as corn sugar to try to stop the opposition to at least slow it. Now GMO crops are trying to do the same thing. That Monsanto uh, uh, Leviathan we thought we couldn't slow is getting the pressure because Bill Gates is in this clip. Uh, Mike Adams, our friend at Natural News, covered it today in a video. And he's on ABC News, one of his paid media partners, where they portray him literally as a saint and tell how he's saving lives. But over time, yes. Uh, countries will need to look at specific GMO products like they look at drugs today where they don't approve them all. They look hard at the safety and the testing and they make sure that the benefits far outweigh uh, any of the downsides. And so the sophistication that we have in drug approval, even the poor countries uh, to avoid starvation, will want to have that for crops as well. And that's just a little short snippet from a long interview from a paid media partner from Bill Gates, the, the foremost patron saint of our time, saving lives around the world by pushing GMOs on everyone. Uh, I think he probably likes the fact that so many farmers commit suicide when they can't even afford the seeds, let alone all the eugenics effects of the seed itself, of all the GMO crops, the cancer and sterility and organ failure that's been shown in study after study, but he keeps pushing it just like vaccines. Anyway, we're going to leave you uh, with a special video premiere that Alex has put together called America, Land of the Snitch. And of course, the interview with Adam Kokesh is also coming up. But first, we'll give you the quote of the day. Our society is run by insane people for insane objectives. I think we're being run by maniacs for maniacal ends, and I think I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. That's what's insane about it. That was John Lennon.
and then later they assassinated him. And now we leave you to the intro to Alex's new mini documentary film. Just a lowly person, and aren't part of the greatest supreme homeland people in black uniforms that I look up to. I'm still part of the federal family that Janet talks about because I snoop for him. And that's what America's about. Total schizophrenic paranoia. Absolutely thinking the terrorists are hiding under every table. Just think, they all look normal, but you know any of them could be a terrorist. Don't trust the public. Only trust Janet, Big Sis Napolitano, and Homeland Security. That's what I've learned. And that's what I do. Yeah, it's in the communities against terrorism alerts. They put out hundreds of them. They say people wearing blue jeans are using cell phones of the terrorist. I work at a local internet cafe, coffee shop, and it told me that there were people doing stuff like trying to have privacy or using voice over IP or communicating through PC games. Man, there's nothing these terrorists won't do. But the number one thing they said was they use cash or credit cards. That's the really scary part. There's a lot of them come in there, a lot of them using cash, and some of them even want to be anonymous and have privacy when they surf the web. Those are the ones you gotta watch. It makes me realize that most of the population are terrorists. There's so many people using cell phones. There's so many people who've got screen blockers, so I can't remember what they're saying. There's even more using cash. Boom, terrorist. The terrorist everywhere. Hold yourself together. You can do it though. You can do it for America. Do it for Janet. Finally, my life means something. I'm the FBI now. Trust no one but Janet Dunbeetle Napolitano. No one but her. You've always wanted to be part of an elite team. You got responsibilities now. Now get out there and start spying. Oh, yeah, he's definitely one. Listen, um, are you, are, oh, oh, why are you paying cash? Yeah, you all right, man? I gotta ask you this. It's just a matter of national security. I'm an important person now. Is there a reason you're paying with cash? Uh, it's only a couple of dollars. I just usually pay cash when it's, you know, not very much money. Yeah. Why? That, that, I mean, you... I don't understand how that's any of your business. But, I mean, the privacy is not what America's about. I mean, I've got to report you to Homeland Security. Are you on meds? No, this is the new Homeland. I mean, the TSA sticks their hands down your pants. I mean... I, don't think, I just think you're acting kind of weird. I just I just want a cup of coffee. All right, yeah, well, and, and with the inflation, it's actually it's actually $5 for a cup of coffee. Do you, do you have some more money? I get, a, I get a cup of coffee, just regular. It's like sure. a medium. Sure, medium, anything else? Uh, I'll get a cookie, too. You'll you get, get a cookie? cookie? All right, sure, yeah, I'll get cookie. that for you. It's a cookie. My God, there's a lot of terrorists. Um, hold, hold on a minute, can you pay with a credit card, please? I don't know if I have enough in my account, so I'm, I'm just going to pay cash. Actually, I, I, have, I have a couple 20s here, so I'm just going to give you a 20. Is that cool? Oh, my God, they're everywhere. Oh, they're everywhere. Oh, hold on. I gotta get myself together. I'm Jack Bauer, Jack Bauer. Can you get my change? This... Can I have that? Thanks. You cool? You're being watched. The homeland's keeping you safe. Okay. By who? Just get out of here. You're lucky. You know, it's a pretty big boost to my ego to realize I'm a good guy because I spy on everybody. Oh, he's 
dangerous. You can tell it. I just act like I'm sneaking up on him. All right. Oh, oh no, it's true. He's looking at InfoWars. In fact, it says in the report that they visit extremist or radical sites. I gotta track him. I gotta do what they told me. Dun, 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 dun. I can almost hear it now. Dun, dun, dun. Oh man, I'm brave. I'm just like those guys on TV. Yes, yes, FBI. I've got him. I've got him. He he bought coffee with cash, and he was using a proxy server to to search the web. Yes. Yes, I've got one of them. He's definitely a terrorist. Da, 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 da. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. What you just saw is ridiculous. And if you're asking, what in the world did I just see? It's dark satire. Comedy. It's very frightening because it's based in reality. The FBI flyer you saw? Real. There's literally hundreds of them. They actually say blue jeans, cell phones, call the police, write down their driver's uh, license number if you can get it, write down their uh, license plate number. Uh, are they using AOL or Comcast? You know, call the police on them. Uh, they may be terrorists. It's really happening. Now, the dramatization you just saw is the intro to a larger documentary film that we've just uh, gotten close to completing that I'm going to be premiering in Dallas coming up this Sunday and then the Sunday after that uh, in Florida. Find out details at infowars.com forward slash events. But never fear, we'll also then be premiering it after I've had those two showings uh, here at prisonplanet.tv. And then, of course, it will leak out uh, to the wider web, which is our full intention. Uh, but, but yes, this is absurd. So is the TSA sticking their hands down our pants while the government openly gives Libya over to al-Qaeda. And Israel uses al-Qaeda groups uh, to attack Iran. And NBC News runs headlines admitting it. i got to give my rights up, but al-Qaeda works for the government and got the underwear bomber on the plane. I mean, it's crazy. The documentary's almost done. I'm trying to come up with a name right now, or I'd tell you the name. And, of course, folks that are there in Dallas and Orlando will know the name and see it first. So hope to see you there. And if not, uh, keep watching here at PrisonPlanet.tv. And we have a 15-day free trial running right now as well with the nightly news, 7 o'clock Central, and the radio show archives, all my films, and much more right here at PrisonPlanet.tv. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? Go to InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv for the latest headlines and cutting-edge information. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at InfoWars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at InfoWars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events.
We are back from break. Uh, of course, as you know, the whole media portrayal has always been that supporting the troops means supporting any neocon candidate who's ready for another war, supporting anyone who will always go for more empire overseas. But the reality is that the majority of donators to politicians in the military donate to Ron Paul, and there's a reason for that. Joining us now to talk about that and an event to support Ron Paul, specifically with uh, people in the military, I guess active and former, is Adam Kokesh, uh, himself a former serviceman and the head of AdamVersusTheMan.com. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to promote this event because it really is such a key one to reaching out to active duty troops and the veterans community with the message of freedom and making sure that they all get what Ron Paul stands for. Well, I think it's a very important thing to break the misconception and the media uh, spin and delusion and, and mind control that they've been doing at least since 9-11 with the yellow ribbons and the supporting the troops, all the American flags, that somehow uh, this is okay because it's in the name of the troops. Absolutely, and, and this event was really inspired by the suppression of the voice of the active duty because th this inconvenient fact about Ron Paul that he's gotten more campaign contributions from active duty service members than all other candidates, including Obama combined, is just doing such a disservice to all of those active duty troops who donated, who wanted to hear their voices heard. And so we're making sure that that, is, that, that message gets out with the Ron Paul is the choice of the troops march and rally in Washington, D.C. on President's Day. It's really exciting. It's coming up on Monday. We're going to be rallying at noon at the Wall Monument marching to the White House in formation, and everybody in that formation will be required to present a proof of service in order to be a part of this event. We're going to do our dress right dress and be right there in front of the White House before we do an about face and a symbolic yeah. gesture of repudiation of our president's foreign policy. We are going to turn our backs to the White House, and we're going to hold a flag folding ceremony and have a folded American flag as you would at a soldier's funeral and render a hand salute and hold it for as many seconds as troops have died since Obama became off, took office, uh, both abroad and by suicide, and then march back to the Washington Monument. So we're very excited to be creating this visual. We're very excited for the opportunity to show that that parallel is there in the veterans community as there is among the active duty for this. But also, I'm really excited to be providing an opportunity for active duty troops to be talking amongst each other, to be reaching out to mm -hmm. each other with this message about questioning our current foreign policy. And it's just, it's such a disgrace that, that military regulations are set up in such a way that the voices of the troops aren't allowed to be heard unless they're serving as props for the president when he gets off Marine One or when Ben Bernanke wants to use the troops at Fort Hood as backdrop for his speech about his economic shenanigans about what he's doing with the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's disgusting to see how disrespected the troops are in reality compared to the rhetoric, compared to the yellow ribbons. And so yeah, they're all supposed to shut up, but, but presidents who didn't even serve or, or who did monkey service where they were on paper serving but didn't even really show up for training or anything, right. they're and supposed Ron to speak Paul, for what we're right. doing. Ron, and and even, even among those token veterans, those you know, who, who uh, joined the Texas Air National Guard or whatever the case was, simply to be able to check that box, they're all out of the race now. There is only one person running for president in the Republican primary who has ever worn the uniform, and that's Ron right. Paul. But more importantly, the message here is not that the troops support Ron Paul despite his foreign policy. It's not like they're going, well, we like the constitutional thing and that he's a veteran and the integrity. That's, those are side benefits. Those are side benefits to the foreign policy because we want a commander in chief, and it shouldn't be any surprise to anybody that those of us who are willing to put our lives on the line to defend this country want a commander in chief who's going to be decisive. And when you ask Ron Paul questions about foreign policy, you know he's got the answers. You know he knows how his principles are applied. We want a commander in chief who's going to put America's security first, not Israel's, not Afghanistan's, not Iraq's. We want a commander in chief who is going to only send the troops in a harm's way with a clear mission and a clear moral imperative, or as Dr. Paul would call it, a constitutional declaration of war. But what's even more exciting to see is that although the troops are being brought to support Ron Paul by his foreign policy message, because we are, as a, as a subculture, not all that different from the rest of the country, we are still 
creatures of pragmatism too. But when you're looking at this, this political debate and going, well, is, is there going to be 100,000 troops or 130,000 troops in Afghanistan? Do I want to be the 130,000th guy that, that deploys just to die for a politician's mistake? You know, that's, that's the kind of question the troops are asking. When you have your life on the line, you're really motivated to find out what a better foreign policy might be. And they're coming to this message, but they're really coming to it because of the foreign policy, because they don't want to be the last person to die for a mistake or for a lie or for a foreign policy. For a mistake, Adam. You talk about making them. clear decisions. Do you remember the presentation where they said the key to winning uh, Afghanistan is deciphering this map with hundreds of points, with terrorism interconnected with the drug smuggling, uh, with the troops not even knowing what side they're working on, all these things. How can we fight a war that way, even if it is just? Well, when you're out in the field every day, I mean, I can tell you, and you're risking your life every day, and, and something strikes you funny, you know, and you go, wait a second, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be here. Maybe we're creating enemies faster than we can kill them. It really wants, it really propels you to go all the way down the rabbit hole. And when the troops hear Ron Paul's foreign policy message, and they hear the principles behind it, the golden rule being applied, to our foreign policy, as Ron Paul was famously booed for at the debate in, in South Carolina, they see the same thing in terms of domestic policy. And they're more compelled than the average American who might be getting along happy-go-lucky every day to speak out, to question things. But they're up against the establishment within the military and the, the, the what they perceive through the mainstream media is an effort to silence such voices of dissent. And we're bringing them out to celebrate them with this event. And, and like I said, we've got, uh, we've got an incredible response. But now we've got over 1,600 RSVP'd on our Facebook event page. And, you know, if, if that comes out to 500 in our actual formation of, of veterans and active duty troops, that would be incredible. And the visual would, would be epic and create something that the mainstream media would really have a hard time denying. But... More importantly, uh, I, we've gotten some last-minute support here, and it's exciting to see. We've got some, some, some angels coming in with some big donations to get behind some radio ads. Uh, we haven't been able to raise that much money independently, but for those of you who are listening who can't be there, who want to be there in spirit, I would ask that you be there with your wallet as well and check out adamversustheman.com slash VFRP, Veterans for Ron Paul. Donate if you can, but if not, if you just want to get active and help out with this most important cause, get on the phone, get on Facebook, get on your email, get in contact with every active duty soldier and veteran you know that's in driving distance from D.C. tonight. Get on the phone, call them. Tell them if they do one thing for you today, if they do one thing for you this year, if they do one thing outside of the military to serve this country, this is it. Because their country still needs them. We still need to hear the voices of the veterans, the voices of the active duty troops. We need to grab the rest of the Republican base by the collar and say, wake up. This is not a conservative foreign policy. Ron Paul is the choice of the troops. And we're timing this just so that we have a chance to have an impact for Super Tuesday, which is two weeks from next Tuesday. So we're really hoping that this can be a, a fun Well, that's the other thing, Adam, is there's so the many race. states yet to vote. People who yeah. can't go to D.C. should go to their capitals and, and the other landmark areas where they are and send that message because the troops have voted with their dollars. It's You know the statistics. I know you covered this. It's overwhelmingly in favor of Ron Paul. By far, they voted, but the media again decided that's not important news. Yet another celebrity death is the most important news still. And it's just amazing. Uh, talk about that. Just talk about the numbers of the troop donations, because some people probably miss that. Well, if it was that Ron Paul was just edging out the other candidates by a little bit, you could argue that it wasn't significant. If it was just a horse race and they were neck and neck with, with, with a bunch of candidates, maybe you could deny the significance of it. But as of last quarter, they've crunched the numbers again. Ron Paul has gotten more contributions from active duty service members than all others, including Obama, put together. And, and as it comes out, it's usually Ron Paul somewhere between 50, 60 percent, and of course the numbers fluctuate from quarter to quarter. But it's Ron Paul clearly dominating with somewhere between 50 to 70 percent even of, of the donations, Obama with, with about a quarter, and all other Republican candidates with less than a quarter of those donations. So the support is really overwhelming. But I, you know, I, have, I have one more announcement to make, if I may, about this event. We're having an after party as well. And it's been really exciting to see how many musicians have come out 
to support Ron Paul. Of course, we had the infamous tweet from Kelly Clarkson. But for this event, we have the cream of the crop of the musical talent of the freedom movement. We've got Amy Allen, Jordan Page, Golden State, and Rebel Inc. all under one roof, all in the same night. But even more exciting than all of that, we had a late addition to the ticket with Michael Graves, former frontman for the Misfits, who came out on, on my YouTube channel just last week with his first public endorsement of Ron Paul. And it's very exciting to see that he's going to be performing a set for us as well. So we still have a few tickets left. If anybody uh, can be in D.C. on Monday and you want to get a ticket for this, the website is march2whitehouse.com, march2whitehouse.com. Of course, you can find all the info from my website, adamversustheman.com. But... We have lots of details on the Facebook event. We have some black and white flyers available now. If people want to print their own and, and pass them out here, we'd really appreciate it. You know, just it, it's been myself and Nathan Cox who decided as, as co-founders of Veterans for Ron Paul 2012 that we were going to plant the flag and we were going to make this happen. And we don't have a massive organization. Adam vs. the Man is, is a one-man band production here. And Nathan Cox actually still has a full-time job that has nothing to do with the freedom movement. Right. So it's really exciting to see that people are jumping in, but that's what it takes to make an event like this a success. The grassroots are behind it, and they're willing to, to volunteer and do a little legwork for us as well. Yeah, and those celebrities that have come forward are just a mark in space of how many people are waking up overall. Uh, but getting back to the military aspects, I mean, how many different founding fathers warned against the danger of a standing army? Smedley Butler in the 20th century warning that essentially the military was being used to be a client for corporations in the third world overseas and that's what's really happening. Uh, can you talk about those aspects? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the best safeguard against the danger of a standing army is an educated population. And I mean an educated population that includes those who would be picking up guns for the government. And that's why the work of Oath Keepers is so important, encouraging the troops to honor their oaths to the Constitution over what illegal orders they may receive. So the fact that we've gotten to such a standing army today where the government can, at the drop of a hat, put not just a battalion of Marines on any beach in the world in 24 hours, but deploy divisions without the taxpayers even noticing it because it's already budgeted for, and create the excuses to, to create special spending bills, because that's really what it's all about. It's all about the exploitation. And, and you know this, your listeners know this, and this is, this is really the, the key dynamic here is that Wars are fought not for defense, uh, not for, uh, for revenge or, or for anything like that. It's for exploitation. It's part of the scam to keep the, uh, the tax cows slaving away and keep the tax dollars flowing to the benefit beneficiaries of government. And the military-industrial complex is the biggest recipient of this welfare. It's a, it's a welfare check. Every time we send a troop out, into, every time we send a soldier into battle unnecessarily, it's, 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 a, it's a meal ticket for someone who's doing nothing to serve anybody else here at home other than making military equipment. And that's, that's the real danger of it, is that the standing army creates an opportunity for the government to spend more money. It creates a temptation for the globalists, for the banksters, for the real exploiters in our system to get us to fight each other, to get humans to, to, to cause so much pain and suffering, to, to, to see... The, 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 what is war but the systematic destruction of human life by machinery, to see that we can be turned to that for their greed. The standing armies are, are, are simply a tool for that. But I, I'm as, as pessimistic as I, as I might be for the midterm or the short term, uh, and, and except if, if we do have the chance of getting Ron Paul elected, I do believe there is still a significant chance that makes it worth fighting for his campaign every single day here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm an optimist in the long term, but I, I know that even in this day and age, with the internet, when we have such global connectedness, when we're able to to have the the truth button here, one click away, and, and see through the lies and see through the propaganda, but at the same time, realize our our shared humanity, uh, globally speaking, that 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 is the kind of globalism I want to support. That that we see that shared humanity, we will be looking back at this day and age. Just, I, I, I feel even, even just decades from now, and we will look back on this as the most shameful episode in human history when we thought that war was an acceptable means of, of conflict resolution in, in, in any way, that, that we were able to do this. And, and, and when we look at the political system today, I mean, as, as Stefan Molyneux has said, I can't imagine people looking back from the future and seeing that we weren't just faking this for everybody's amusement because it's become so absurd. 
But at the same time, it's become so tragic. It's become so painful. And for those of us who have seen it firsthand, we want to make it stop. We want to make it stop. If you support the troops, help us make it stop. Support the troops who support Ron Paul. I hear you, Adam. I want to bring this up, too, because what kind of freedom, quote-unquote, are they building here at home? They've branded returning vets as potential extremists. There was a case this week uh, where a vet called a, a help hotline, and uh, he wasn't even suicidal or anything, and they swarmed his house and took his guns. You've got this prepper in the news. We covered it today. He was labeled mentally defective and barred from his Second Amendment through the FBI background check, and obviously uh, that's something they want to pin on a lot of vets. Do you see veterans waking up to this? Is there on the, this on the radar? Is it just a few? Is this beginning to swell in all the ranks? I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd like to be optimistic about that one in, in particular. I do think it's swelling because every soldier that comes home from these wars is a potential extremist, is a potential dissident, is a potential threat to the government. Because when you come home from an experience like this, when you have been both the victim and the victimizer, and you see that there was no just cause behind what you were a part of, when there was no moral imperative to risking your life, there was no just cause that your buddies died for. That's why you see the kind of record suicides mm -hmm. among veterans. And so in that sense, veterans continue to be victims of government, continue to be victims of that experience. And part of that is because there aren't positive, peaceful outlets for confronting government. And that's what the Ron Paul campaign provides. That's what we're hoping to provide with this event with Veterans for Ron Paul 2012. Because there are so many troops that come home from this and just drink themselves into bottles and destroy their lives because they're so frustrated and there isn't that outlet. But I, I do think that they're waking up and I do think that veterans in particular, as mem former members of the Praetorian class, many continuing as members of the, of the police force in that effort, are extra motivated to wake up. And with the internet, with the, with the Alex Jones show, with the InfoWars nightly news, with the, the information that's out there that's just one click away. For any veteran that's able to question things, they're able to get all of the answers really easily and, and see all of that right there. And I just want to reach out specifically, if I may, to, to the veterans in the audience here who might be dealing with these issues, who might be dealing with you know, post-traumatic stress disorder or some symptoms that don't quite raise themselves to that level of, of diagnosis, but who are struggling with their experience. And I just want to say, please, find a way to speak out, find a way to have your voice heard because it's empowering and it's essential to the healing process for yourself. Yeah, that's therapy Taking, too. Exactly, and it was for me, you know, for starting to speak out when I came home, but PTSD, uh, dealing with it, getting to the point where you have a handle on it is about taking what's rattling around in your subconscious and getting it front and center in your conscious mind, whether it's through activism or public speaking or writing or making videos or art or music, whatever it is, Find a way to do that. Don't bury those feelings. Don't bury those thoughts. Address them. Get into it. And I'll bet when you do, you'll find that not only will you be able to come to a place of much better self-control and, and happiness and centeredness in terms of your own life and being able to, to have processed and dealt with your own experience, but you'll also be empowered to help the world learn from your experience. And that's what we're doing with this event. That's what we're doing with Veterans for Ron Paul 2012. And, and I hope that uh, for, for the veterans listening that they would take this as an opportunity to get involved, not just to help me, to help the cause, to help Ron Paul, but to help yourselves. That's well said, Adam, because us being so far down the rabbit hole, we could see how much things are turned on their head, uh, but we need everyone else to put on the glasses too and, and shatter that illusion with the Ron Paul election as a case example. But the whole society we're building. It's really dangerous, and I hope uh, this helps people wake up. You're gathering at the Washington Monument, what, Monday? Is that February the 19th? Is that the right February, date? Monday, February 20th. It's 20th. President's Day, so it's a holiday, and we know all the federal employees and hopefully most of the members of the military in, uh, at the local bases here will have that day off. So it's a really great opportunity. Like I said, we're getting the last minute radio ads going out now, but if you can reach out to individual veterans or active duty troops that you know in the area, we would greatly appreciate the support and that outreach. And it's a great opportunity to spread the message. But the, the website is march2whitehouse.com. 
And, of course, you can get to it all through my website. And again, I think for those not on the East Coast, uh, it's a great opportunity, too, to influence upcoming uh, primary states. But you Adam, know, we, Adam, we have vets from all over the country coming for this, so we need money yeah. to, to help pay for transportation at this point still, too. Well, it's a great idea to put a spotlight on the fact that the military really have uh, uh, weighed in on the presidential election and so much more. Thanks for joining us, Adam Kokesh, AdamVersusTheMan.com, and one more time with the event website. March2WhiteHouse.com. March, the number two, WhiteHouse.com. March to WhiteHouse.com. You get your tickets now. They're selling out fast. All right. We'll speak to you again uh, in the future, Adam. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that is it for the InfoWars Nightly News. We still have a subscription special available, 44% off. Uh, if you decide to help fund that operation, you help us get this message out to so many other people. Uh, you see what all these media platforms are doing in the time of the Internet to reach people, awaken them, and help refocus them on what's important, whether it's constitutionally minded uh, or anything else, to fight against this terrible beast system. Uh, so we do hope you'll support all those efforts and reach people however you can. Until next time, good night.